Hey, listen up, y'all. I'm going to shout out this young gun right here because he's trying to do his thing. Joseph Jaffe, not famous. Probably rightfully so, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm famous because, you know, he not famous. And he like, yo, let me call my famous friends and see if they'll shout me out and make me more famous, sir. Right? But so, you know, you know, Joseph Jaffe, man, it's cool. You got your late night talk show popping off. That's what's dope. Streaming. Been doing your thing, man. Started this in, you know, in March of the 20, 2020, which is, you know, tough throughout the years. But booking great guests, man. Jamal Mashboard and James Rollins. Uh, steady building it, man. Keep it popping off, man. Keep building your brand, man. Believe in yourself. Keep going hard, all right? That's what it's all about. One of these days. This little acronym of yours, not famous, is not going to be true. People going to see you in the mall and be like, I know who you is. Them going to be your cousins saying it all incorrect like that. But you know what I'm saying? You know what you going to do. What you going to do? They just, they family. All right, bro. I'll holler. A spring in your step. There is a twinkle in your eye. I, 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 can, I can throw a rhyme down for you real quick. <laughs> Yes, they call me Thrill. They say that I'm the man. You disagree, how could you? Let me make you understand. Should we bring her on the show? Can anybody find me? And I am Thrill. There she is. Press as some bread. Provide her from the oven. When you feel rejected, get some my good loving. Take on me. She looks wonderful. Mom looks amazing. Somebody too. Okay, more bugger off now. I've got to show it to you. No. Like that? Joseph Jaffe, ladies and gentlemen. You just made the new intro of the show. <laughs> Yes, 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 it is March 31st. It is Thursday, March 31st. Tom Morris is here. He said, whenever I arrive on time, the party starts late. Uh, I don't know what you mean, Tom. Uh, we started exactly on time. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, maybe he's referring to March 31st. It is the end of the first quarter, 2022. Can you believe that? Can you believe that we are already one third of the year gone? Well, I hope you're doing well. I hope you hit your quotas. I hope you are entering Q2 strong, strong, strong as you can be physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, financially, anything else that ends in illy. Because that's what I wish for you. Now, my guest today is Simon Mainwaring, the very famous Simon Mainwaring, the James Bond uh, of the business. Uh, look how suave and debonair he is. And then on Monday, speaking of suave and debonair, Gregarious Narain will be on the show. And we are almost, almost fully booked into April, through April, I might say. Now, there is no show on Friday, no NFT Fridays, but, 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 we are giving away some NFTs. Let's do that right now. Let's give away an NFT or Angel Alliance. Let's spin the wheel. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner. We will have a winner. Our winner for the Angel Alliance NFT is joelhk2014 at gmail.com. Do not email him. Come on. Don't do that. Uh, but yeah, you won. You won. I'm so happy for you. And we're going to do one more drawing for this magnificent NFT from Terrera all the way from Nigeria, West Africa. Let's spin the wheel again. We just give away stuff all the time on this, don't we? So... You have no music, but you just, uh, yeah, I can do Jeopardy music for you. And the winner for this is Monty Water. Monty Water, uh, use this NFT well. Hodl it, hodl it. Hold on for dear life. Support art, support artists. It is time for us to take the struggling out of the phrase struggling artist, struggling artist no more, because that is the power, my friends, of we is greater than me. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot about that. But first, we're going to get to a seated soliloquy. And yes, I know, I know you want some Jaffe coin. I was a little bit mean on the show on Wednesday. 
I gave away half a Jaffe coin, which is about $6, but you needed to own 50 of those Jaffe coins. Today, all you have to do is own one measly Jaffe coin, and I will give you some Jaffe coin back as my way of saying thank you. This QR code is only live as long as the show is live. So this is a way to recognize and reward community, audience, the we, the we, because this show is not just about me. That's why it's called Joseph Jaffe is not famous because it isn't about me. It is about my guests. It is about the community we're building. It is about this ecosystem that we are all a part of where value is created by all of us and value is shared by all of us as well. So uh, get yourself some Jaffe coin. And now it's time to get into said soliloquy, which surprise, surprise, uh, is called We is Greater Than Me. Now, I have to tell you that this, uh, and if you're looking at the equation, uh, we is greater than me, not we is equal to me. Yes, we've heard many things. My friend Brian Fanzo talks a lot about this idea, um, and he says you can't be the best we unless you are first the best me, right? Uh, a point about self-care, which I think is very much taken. But but what, what does it mean we as opposed to me? Well, I, I think, and, and let's just talk about, let's talk about, let's talk about we capitalism versus me capitalism. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that you don't have to have an incompetent, generally old white guy, uh, no offense, Simon or myself, because we're both old white guys, but you don't have to have an incompetent, because Simon is competent and I'm somewhat competent. You don't have to have someone at the top of the company with his golden parachute. And yes, it's normally uh, it's normally uh, 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 a he as well. And uh, I, I don't get it. I don't get the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. I don't get the fact, and I will never forget this, um, I believe it was Abigail Disney. Uh, at one point, she um, leveled an accusation to the chairman of Disney, and she said, and she calculated that if he, if he, were to pay for a 15% pay rise, a salary increase, for every single person that worked for Disney, every single person, 15% pay rise, he would still end up with about $24 million bonus at the end of the year. Now, I would say that's a lot of money, $24 million. Uh, I can tell you that I did not earn that uh, this year, nor last year, nor next year. Um, but I do think it's time that we start thinking about this idea of really, it's not socialism. It's not redistribution of wealth. It is just a reprioritization that actually says, guess what? And you've heard this. You've heard this from me before. My first boss said his motto was have fun, make money. And I changed it to have fun, do good, make money. It's not an either or. It is an and. It is an and. We can figure out a way to just change, tweak, make a few small incremental changes. And in doing so, change the world, change lives. That is the power of we. And that's probably why I'm so excited right now, not just to be in Web3, not just to be launching the Alpha Collective with a view of creating a we versus me, but why I'm excited to introduce overdue, belated Simon Mainwaring to the show. I'm just going to skip all that stuff. Like, you know, you, you're not meant to just like after that whole climax, I guess what I was just going to say is, uh, sure, what the hell, I'll say it anyway. There's Brian Fanzo. This, these are my partners. These are the we's associated with Alpha Collective. But let's get on with the show and let's bring Simon uh, on to the show, a little bit about him. Um, Simon is the founder and CEO of award-winning strategic consultancy, WeFirst, working with today's top purpose-led brands. 
He's a New York Times bestselling author of We First that was named Best Marketing Book of the Year by Strategy and Business. Thankfully for him, my book came out one year before. Uh, he is the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Lead with We, named the number two top business book of 2021 by Forbes. And again, thankfully, mine came out two years before that. His company, We First, is a real leader's top 100 impact company in the US and a B Corp uh, best for the world honoree. I've taught my students this year, last year, about the power of the B Corp. He's a real leader's top 50 keynote speaker in the world. Uh, he was a can lion and one show jury member. He's the host of Lead with We podcast on United Airlines and the author of influential Forbes column, Purpose at, Your, uh, at, Purpose at Work. Is there anything this man cannot do? Uh, he probably even could uh, read a bio better than me. Simon, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. That was quite the intro, and I'm so glad to be here. And it is overdue, for sure. I know. I mean, we were like doing so many juggles and reschedules and, you know, the stuff that you don't see out there right. uh, in, in, the, uh, in the ether, in the etherium or the ethernet or uh, the streaming world. Uh, but I mean, this is, I've been excited to have you on the show for a long, long time. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, for those who don't know, we've known each other for 10, 12 years and we all circle, it's like airplanes circling the same airport, but you're never in the same transit lounge at the same time. So a pleasure to be here. Well, that is true. But and, but if you are uh, at JFK tomorrow night, then we might be actually in the same transit lounge at the same time. Hand on my heart. I promise not to be there with you. All right. Well, I, I, I will miss you. I'm actually going to be uh, lecturing my students from the lounge tomorrow, oh, uh, wow. which which is one better than what I did last year, where I actually taught a class from my hospital bed. Uh, and that was an experience. Uh, you cannot say that I'm not committed. To you my you should be committed. Absolutely. You should be. Exactly. 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 Committed. Uh, isn't that a, a great Mae West uh, uh, quote, uh, which is yes. marriage is an institution, but I'm not ready for an institution yet. Um, I think she also said, I, I was pure as the driven snow, but then I drifted. I mean, yeah. can you believe? I mean, I mean, what are the odds that both of us would just launch with May West quotes? Everybody <laughs> needs a role model, right? We all need a role model. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, uh, we, can o we can only go uh, up from here. I mean, down from here. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, so Simon, there is a lot to cover, but I will say, um, first of all, uh, it is March uh, 31st, and it is an important day. It is, uh, it is the uh, Transgender Day of Visibility. Um, it's in the news. It's all around us right now. And uh, I want to just say a little shout out uh, to uh, a lovely trans woman that I met at South by Southwest, uh, this is Jayla Sullivan, and she's one of the uh, she's one of Lizzo's big girls uh, squad. Uh, that series is out right now. I think it's on Amazon Prime. And uh, this was a little selfie uh, with one of the big girls, the self-anointed or self-appointed big girl. Um, right. So shout out and go and acknowledge uh, go go and acknowledge uh, someone today in the transgender in the trans community because it is their day of visibility and of course it shouldn't have to be on one day uh, but go out there and do your part and uh, and that's another part of the we right the right. the fact that it isn't just about you or me hey we look the same we act the same we come from the same place we have the same privilege it's about it's about all of us uh, is part of that royal we correct completely. completely I mean I think you know I deeply believe that we didn't come into this world as bad people who disliked each other, nor do we come into the world as people who want to destroy the environment that makes our lives possible. And in fact, the opposite is true. We're hardwired to connect deeply with each other and to love each other and to embrace a sense of community. And the same way we're, we're, you know, we're designed and chemically reinforced to look after the natural world around us. So I think a lot of what we see going on right now is actually against our innate nature. And I'm I'm very, very positive about this sort of new renaissance of, on an individual level and a collective level that's showing up right now. So couldn't agree more. Right. And, uh, unless you're Tucker Carlson, in which case you're, uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not really kidding. But, right. but, but, but you made a very good point there, which is, which is 
what's going on. When you say what's going on is against our nature, define what is the what that's going on. Yeah. And and I love this idea of it's actually against our nature, which means right now it isn't a natural state. So you would think that the human body, the the mind, the, the spirit would do everything in its power to get back to this uh, equilibrium or natural state. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to set up one little concept up front that I think sometimes we lose sight of. If you think about the phrase human nature, right? Think about it this way: we are the human expression of nature we are a subset of the natural world so this false opposition between humanity and the planet or me against you or us against them it just doesn't make any sense we are like all things in nature part of a larger ecosystem and to your question what's going on that causes so many problems right now the net result of all of our conscious or unconscious actions over the last several decades especially since the 50s and the industrial revolution is that you know We've got the climate emergency, loss of biodiversity, ocean acidification. We've got social inequities. We've got carbon in the air, chemicals in the soil, plastics in the ocean, all of which is threatening all of our futures, irrespective of what side of the political aisle you sit on. And I think this is compounded, and there's been a lot of dialogue around this, you know, the social dilemma, the film and so on, by the role of technology that, you know, given the data we provide about ourselves, we get data back to us or content back to us that compounds, reinforces our points of view, the net result of which is it's polarized us all. So we're more divided than ever. And the cost of that is this. We can't even degree, agree on what reality looks like, let alone solve it. You know, if you ask different people in different parts of the country, let alone around the world, they've got a very different experience of their community, their state, the country and the state of the globe. And until we can really align around common values, shared interests, and common challenges, it's very hard to get people to work together. So what's going on is that we're being pulled apart, which is against our fundamental nature, at a time where we've got to come together like never before. So I, I was thinking maybe for a second when you said we we haven't we can't even agree what reality looks like. I was like, he's not referring to augmented reality versus mixed reality versus no. extended reality versus virtual reality. No, it's true, and it's it's unbelievable. Sometimes I, you know, sometimes I think back to debate when I was at school, where every time you know a, a horn rang or a bell rang, you had to just change your argument. You were right. you were you know you were pro life, you were pro choice, and you just had to seamlessly go and sure. and, and and argue the point. And I think, uh, I mean, it's like, can we not see it? It's so obvious that if one side says says up, the other one's going to say down. And if, quite yeah. frankly, if that first side had said down, the other one would have said up. Yeah. And it's it's just, it, it it's kind of ridiculous and juvenile. But to your point, it's actually a fervent belief here. It's not contrarianism. It's the fact that that literally two people are looking at the same thing and seeing two completely opposite uh, ends of the spectrum. And I, I agree. And I think that what underscores that is a way of looking at the world which could be characterized as individuated and scarcity and fearful. Like if it's not yours, it's mine. If you're not for me, you're against me. You know, um, if you're not my friend, you're my enemy. Rather than looking at it from a, a, a sense of abundance and community and contribution. And I think that mindset, and it's a much longer, deeper dialogue, you know, has been established by economic theory in different ways and has been compounded by the media and has been exacerbated by the disproportionate wealth and how we're supposed to aspire to that of others. But here's the true cost of this whole mindset. Companies can't survive in societies that fail. When the whole breaks down, the parts can't thrive. And since the 1950s onwards, we've really cannibalized the life-giving force that makes all of our lives possible. To the point now that we really, we're like minutes away from midnight. If you listen to COP26 or the World Economic Forum or the IPCC report, there's real challenges that will compromise all of our lives. And we're, it's a moment of reckoning. And we're heading towards that cliff. And we're going to have to turn 90 degrees pretty damn quickly. And business is sitting front, you know, front and center of that because they cause so much of the problem and are uniquely positioned to be the biggest solution. 
It just depends whether we'll, enough hands will be on the wheel and we'll hold that wheel tight enough to actually make the turn we need to make or we go out in a glorious blaze of glory after which Mother Nature and the planet goes, well, that species was a curious experiment. And by the way, let's not do that again. Yeah, ex exactly. Which is uh, which is control alt delete on on us pesky humans. Uh, Tom it's says empty trash, empty trash, right? You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Recycle bin. Tom says if we can't converge around truth, we'll converge around extinction. I prefer truth. Well, you know, I I prefer Tom Morris. Uh, he is our uh, resident philosopher. Double. Right. Uh, double Yale PhD. He was a professor of philosophy at Notre Dame. He pays me to say that, uh, uh, as opposed to it pains me to say that neither is true. Um, but this is his contribution today, and it is called Me and We. Hi, I'm philosopher Tom Morris. There's a great deal of wisdom to be found about identity and what we would now call branding amongst the great thinkers in history. According to most historians of the past, we human beings started out as having our identity more in the group, in the tribe, in the collective, than in the individual. Uh, people thought of themselves, the I, in terms of the we. But then as human history unfolded, we found a greater and greater sense of the ego, the individual, the sole and solitary proprietor, me, myself, and I, as being celebrated. In fact, you get to philosophers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and his famous essay on self-reliance, and you see the assertiveness of the individual. Emerson was so concerned that young Americans of his time, about 100, 150 years ago, were looking to the past, were looking to Europe, were looking to the great collectives of thought, the great civilizations of the past to define themselves. And he wanted them to start with their own souls, their own spirits, and define themselves as themselves unto themselves and make their distinctive contribution to the world as individuals. And yet in our day, you know, less than 200 years later, we're discovering the importance of the we once more. We're coming to understand that the freedom of the individual has to be understood in terms of the obligations and opportunities of society, that the sole individual alone cannot bring the power to the world that the well-integrated team or group can. We're being called upon to rethink our understanding of individual freedom and individual power in terms of society in terms of a harmony of the greater whole. And when we, we bring this sense of the we in the best possible definition to bear on the individual brand of me, we get that higher harmony and we get that greater power for good that the sole proprietor as a maverick alone can only miss. So as Aristotle said, the greatest good is People in partnership for a shared purpose. People, plural, in partnership, a certain relationship for a shared purpose. Pursue that with others, and you see great things happen. Happy philosophy. Brought out the big guns for you, Simon. Thank you so much. And I love it. You had the guitars in the background in case you wanted to break out an axe and put a musical close on it. And you can't even play the guitar. It's all for show. Absolutely. A surfboard above me, same thing. Never touch water. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, so you bring up a very interesting point. And I was thinking, here we are having this deep, meaningful uh, conversation of substance. It's so sublime. I would hate to get ridiculous with you for a moment, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyway because because everybody everybody knows the serious Simon Mainwaring. Everyone yeah. knows that he's going to come in and is going to help us save the world or save the world from ourselves. Um, but people really sometimes just want to know who the real Simon Mainwaring is. So oh. here's what we found about you. I wouldn't um, find out too much. You are generally quite clean cut, I um, will say. But we okay. did find out that you are a great cake maker. Um, so 
when will we see you on one of these uh, shows on television? You know, it's a hidden secret, but I've, I've made a cake with a different theme for every year of my daughter's life since they were born, and they're 22 and 19 now, and it's kind of like a living narrative. I'll, you know, one time it's a Snapchat cake, another time it's a mermaid cake, but they're all different for every year for each of the girls. So who knows? I kind of feel like maybe uh, we're going to need uh, to make NFTs of your entire, of your cake collection. Okay. Um, okay. And please, please send them our way so we can share updates, cake updates. Cake uh, updates? Uh, with our, <laughs> cake updates with our audience. Now, uh, the, the other thing we found out, and, you know, clearly it's, it's uh, people, are, people are watching right now and they're thinking to themselves, I cannot believe that there are two South Africans on the show. But no... Wow. In fact, you are uh, Australian. How do, we, how do we know he's Australian? Because we actually have a photo uh, of him. Uh, and see, I mean, he, you just do not get more Australian than this. You know, Joseph, I don't appreciate a naked photo of me like that. Um, you, know, you know, the genitalia in full view. And you know what? As an Australian, we like to sunbake naked. So it's okay. I'm just telling you that all, all that was, uh, I'm looking at a tail. I'm not sure what you're looking at, but oh, uh, yeah. but enough yeah. e enough about kangaroos. Uh, we only have one, uh, one more somewhat, uh, I don't even know if this is embarrassing. It's just a question, which is, I was looking, I was looking in the archives uh, for photos of, uh, of you past, present, uh, and even future. And I'm just wondering who is the gentleman on the right? The gentleman on the right is a younger version of myself who did what a lot of men do at a, of a certain age, which is to try coloring your hair and doing it at home to disastrous results. And you know the worst thing about that? My family loved me enough to tell me that, but my friends did not come up to me and say, dude, what are you doing? And, you know, to this day, I call them out on it. So I think the guy on the right is a tragic, early, a uh, 10 year younger version of the man on the left. Well, I have to. I have to say that there is no question in my mind uh, that the 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 guy on the right clearly is a John Travolta wannabe. Uh, a little bit of an Australian connection with respect to Olivia Newton John, but 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 the uh, the James Bond esque man on the left. Um, all I can all I can say is in thirty five years when I turn fifty one. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope I look like that gentleman is, and and you're not even fifty. But anyway, enough. Am, I'm actually fifty five. This just turned fifty five. So there you go. And I am tragically fifty one. <laughs> but thank God I'm fifty one. I swear to God, you're going to catch up. I don't know how, but it's it's possible these days. So. Well, may I always be four years behind you? <laughs> um, and and you know what? You're a good. You're a great role model. Let's get back to the serious stuff because you know what? This stuff is serious, and it and it can be. I think it can be sometimes a little bit suffocating, which is right. when you try and when you try and hold. We are not Atlas, right? When you try and hold the weight of the world on your shoulders, when when you look at what's going on right now in the Ukraine, it's just it it's inconceivable. And I tell you, Simon, like one of the things that I don't understand is how you just see people talking about this stuff on TV, and I'm like, if 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 these nations are at war, like why are they giving interviews? Like why is there, why are there interviews? It, like it, the whole thing just doesn't make sense. War yeah. to me is like watching a movie. It's like, it's not real. And and then I see the devastation and I see what's happening and I see how long it's going to take uh, for an entire region uh, to recover. But I set this up in terms of sometimes it all feels like it's too much. But you have a unique point of view in terms of the role that business can play. And, and I have to tell you, mm -hmm. I cannot stress how much I agree with this vision because it is vision that says, you know what, finally, business, if businesses do not want to suck, like I wrote about in Built to Suck, they have a purpose. They have a play. This could be a Hail Mary, yep. but it is worth punting, which is to say, if governments cannot get the job done then big business with their scale have a, a chance to actually be the heroes. It's true. And to your earlier point about looking at war and what's going on in Ukraine, the crazy thing is we're so desensitized to all of this now. So, you know, you see this nightly news cycle and these updates, each one of them in their own right should be just cause for alarm. But when you have that kind of CNN 24 news cycle, 
it's almost like you're adrenalized the whole time. And the net result is that you kind of get desensitized to it, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's the number of deaths due to COVID-19. Coming back to your last point, you know, for a long time, business sought the responsibility of business ended at the edges of business, which is, you know, fiduciary duty to shareholders, bricks and mortar stores, headquarters, corporate responsibility, and so on. But over the last five years, you've seen same-sex marriage, gun control, voting rights, women's empowerment, climate emergency. Business has been really stepping up to play a role because not only are they responsible for the problems, they're actually, you know, they are uniquely positioned to provide a solution. And it became even more elevated in the last, you know, month or so with the war in Ukraine, the invasion by Russia, because not only did you see the biggest companies in the world do something unprecedented, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Starbucks, pulling out of a country because in protest of, you know, its aggression towards another nation state. But then you saw the president of, you know, the defending country, Ukraine, Zelensky, reach out and try to communicate with the CEO of another organization out there, for example, Mark um, Schneider at Nestle, and have a dialogue between the CEO of a global corporation and the head of state about, for example, pulling out of Russia. So it could not get more elevated. It literally is life and death, in, and business is now playing in that context. And I think you're absolutely right. I think business is, is so deeply interwoven into the actions of government with all the lobbying and all the money that goes on behind the scenes that drives legislation and policy and advocacy and so on, that you know not only are they complicit in the problems, but they can leverage their might to actually make individuals, government officials, countries at large do something differently. And we are at such a state of urgency now that if they don't do it, they've only got themselves to blame and they're going to be the ones bearing the cost as well as everyone else. It's a great point, and I actually jotted down this this thought of uh, what I called reverse lobbying, uh, which is maybe or maybe less special interest groups, which is which is I hadn't thought about it that way. Which is corporations have always had their grubby little paws, you know, into uh, government in different shapes and forms. Why not use that same leverage now to influence at a political uh, at a political and even a policy level? But I'll, I'll add one more point and then turn it back to you, which is what's interesting to me, and I've and I've been teaching this now in 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 both my classes. I'm teaching marketing and strategic communications, and and the and the thing that that to me just blew me away was for the first time, not acting was now being scrutinized. Yeah. It never was like that. It it was always what if we do it and what will happen and will we lose and now it's like no it's not even that we that we pulled out. It's you pulled out too slowly. You yeah. withdrew. You kind of boycotted Russia. You yeah. took your time. You were too conservative and and by being a laggard you're basically showing your lack of empathy and sensitivity to humanity. It's true. And I mean, if you look at the data through things like Edelman's Trust Barometer report, it actually says that consumers will boycott a brand and never return if they don't play a role in social and political issues, not business issues, social and political issues. And here's the truth. And I want to take it one step further than what you said, which I completely agree with. We're all guilty of this. Every single one of us, I am guilty of this. You, Joseph, are guilty of this because our actions, conscious or unconscious, overt or covert, explicit or implicit, have all always had a consequence. That, you know, how much packaging is on that company? What type of diet do we have? You know, what car do we drive? And so on and so on. The mess we're in today is an aggregate of all of those seemingly innocuous choices that you and I as individuals make that now have laddered up to where we are today. So in the same way, the government has kind of been, you know, supported by business in ways that aren't transparent, and now they can leverage it to better effect. Each of us two are on the hook to say, well, if I really believe that I want to solve for the climate crisis, or if I'm really concerned about this issue in my community, am I going to show up? Or am I going to just sit there and say, everybody else is bad, and I'm going to wait for someone else to solve the problem? Look, I mean, no nowhere was that more apparent uh, than in in the presidential election that saw uh, Trump being elected. And regardless of what a position is on that, the fact is apathy, right? right. We always talk about empathy. Well, well, uh, this, is not, this is not a game of Wordle, right? This is the game of life. But apathy 
had huge implications in terms of people that that either stayed home or just said, you know what, I'll let somebody else sort that out for me. It's not my problem. It's somebody else's problem. And guess what? When enough people say the same thing, what ends up happening is, is Facebook. I mean, classic. So you talk about culpability. I'll talk about it. Yeah. I should have just closed down my Facebook account, right. you know, from, from right at the Cambridge Analytica issue, but certainly, you know, after Social Dilemma came out. But you know what? As a thought leader, as a keynote speaker, as a consultant, as a whatever, I needed Facebook, like uh, a different type of drug hit. I needed wow. the reach, et cetera. And so what did I do? You know, I kept it at arm's length. But still there, and right. and and I think the message here is: at some point, we all have to like stand up, step up, look at the reflection. That's a different we. That's the reflection in the mirror, and say, you know, the buck stops here. Yeah, it's true. And there's, you know, what do we mean by we? Is it you and your family? Is it you and your community? Is it you and your political party? There's lots of different dimensions to it. But the larger point is this, you know, which is well taken. Everyone is talking about the shift from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. You know, and by that stakeholder capitalism means everyone from suppliers to communities to employees to partners and, and the environment should all benefit in the spoils of capitalism. But what I don't hear enough talk about is sharing in the responsibilities of stakeholder capitalism. Every single one of us is on the hook. And we've got to, for example, buy the right type of products that send a signal to the market forces to shift and reward those companies that are doing less bad and more good. So every single choice we make every single day is another opportunity to move things in the right direction instead of sitting there and looking at the headlines every day and saying, oh my God, we're absolutely screwed. What are we gonna do and who's gonna fix it for us? So I do think this is a, the age of agency in as much as each one of us has to step up and assume our individual and collective responsibility to make a difference. I, I really, really love the point about uh, contribution. And I, I mean, uh, about responsibility, that was actually what I wanted to say, which is, you know, everyone is talking about in this now web three space, why right? we is greater than me. And everyone talks about community. And then, you know, recently I've, I've built onto that and I've spoken about connection. It's not really about community, it's about connection. But earlier, you know, you you mentioned a new C word. Of course, as consultants, we we're obliged to be alliterative. But yep. that word contribution is brings us back to responsibility. That says, you know what? If you are part of a collective or a community, what are you doing to actually make make this a safe place, a safe space, a productive place? Are you just fire hosing and consuming? Are you just taking? Or are you giving in return? And it doesn't matter who you are in that ecosystem. You have a, a right, a role, a responsibility uh, to step up and make and make a contribution. And I think that that C word is one that we need to start talking about even more. Yeah, I think you know when you think about community, the whole idea of community is only possible if you take a contributory mindset. I add to it. And so does everybody else, so that the sum is greater than the parts. When you individuate completely in your mindset, it's extractive. What can I get? And so you're not only robbing others of what you're taking, but also the potential aggregate of everybody's efforts. So it's, there's a much, much smaller return over the short and long term. And also, you know, there's a great thought leader and author out there, Robert Tursik, who talks about, and you mentioned Web3 and the metaverse and so on. My concern is this. In the same way we've seen large corporations all around the world effectively colonize you know, the planet over the last couple of centuries, and you have variations today, and maybe that list of who's at the top changes, the metaverse is no different, or Web3 is no different. I mean, you've got the promise of decentralization and the blockchain. And we saw the migration from crypto through to DeFi, through to NFTs and, and, and Web3 and the metaverse and so on. And what we have to be very mindful of, and Robert talks about this, is, you know, are we going to be slaves or are we going to be citizens of the metaverse? Because as these large corporations go in there and large institutions go in there early, consciously or not, they set up the parameters for participation for those who join after them, consumers, citizens, and so on. And so there's an inherent tension 
in the in the world of the, the decentralized promise of the blockchain between the mindset that we've displayed out here in the real world and we see the consequences all around us and the promise of decentralization in the in, in the in the in the web three world and you've got tim berners lee and so many others out there thinking through how to restore the integrity of the web and how to make sure that web three is something that is truly an open marketplace for participation and it's going to be fascinating to see if this will really play out and survive in that world when it didn't do so well out in the real world. <laughs> I got, you, you need the air horn. That was, that was like a mic drop uh, moment. Let's, I, I mean, I mean, I think there's, I, I want to just continue that thought for a second, which is this idea of we're setting it up for the people that come after us, I guess, whether we know it or not and whether we recognize it or not, but how much of this is, in fact, just perpetuating, maybe not the status quo, but these, you know, these these old god type of mechanisms where, you know, the Matthews effect, where the rich get richer, you know, and the poor get poorer, you know, the board Abe Yacht Club, uh, you know, sitting at the top of the world, at the top of the top of the top of the food chain now, and and everyone else getting rugged at the bottom. It, yeah. it, it it doesn't seem like the promise to your point of of we is is actually there right now. In fact, in fact, right now there are a lot of me's in the form of scammers and yeah. you know etc. that are that are really take and 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 I suppose Simon the, the the scammer that that you really really um, want to be the most afraid of is the one that looks like your friend yeah. um, and stabs you in the back. That's very true. And I think, you know, we're seeing a little bit of the fallout of the froth around the NFT world right now, where, you know, I was reading the other day that a third of all, you know, NFT launches have, are now defunct and they have no arguable value out there in the NFT marketplace. And, you know, it, we've got to be really, really careful that we distinguish between selfishness, which is your own well-being coming at the cost of somebody else, and healthy self-interest, which might be to participate in the NFT marketplace in a way to facilitate and build community, not only you know within the NFT uh, world itself, but then back out in the real world where you convene people and the NFTs become a, a sort of badge or membership to community. And it, it's almost like we've got this new blank canvas where human nature, which is a lofty term, which invites more sort of discussion, but where human nature is going to be on display. And there's going to be an arm wrestle between our better angels and our sort of selfish motives and that will determine how to what degree the promise of the blockchain is you know um redeemed and it allows us to restore some better balance in the ways that all of those who believe in the promise of um the blockchain hope for or is it just going to be as you say version 3.0 of just mixed motives selfishness and you know, winner takes all. And it's it's yet to be determined. I was just in Puerto Rico and saw folks down there and I'm listening to the dialogues and what's going on. And it's really, here's the funny thing. It's not for anyone else to determine how it's going to work out. It's for every single one of us as individuals in the spirit of community, as you said, to be the keepers, protectors and advocates for how we want things to go. And so that's a whole other version of the power of we in as much as we might be able to create a space that's much more inclusive and much more rewarding to more people. I, I love that. And I was actually thinking to myself, as you were saying that, inherently there's a problem that we're calling it Web3 mm -hmm. because because that, because that it's iterative. It's right. Web2 and, and then some people are going, well, actually it's Web2.5 mm -hmm. because it's somewhat centralized and somewhat decentralized. And I'm like, well, wait a second. If Web2 didn't work out so well, with respect to data, with respect to trolls, with respect to deep faking, with respect to et cetera. Exactly. Why do we assume that the incremental, the new release is going to be exponentially better? Surely we we should be calling it like, remember those, those, uh, those unconferences, we need to be calling yeah. it like unweb 1.0. Yeah, like exactly. I think that's what the Tim Ferriss Lee is one of the founders of the web and so on are talking about. And you think about the, the massive theft that it caused that happened this week, I think it was 600 million on a gaming platform that was taken. That doesn't help anybody, you know, and dark money and what's going on with, you know, Russia and how they're avoiding sanctions and the role of, you know, cryptocurrencies in that world. You know, it's a very, very complicated dialogue that's going on. And, uh, 
you know, I, it is interesting. We are like the frog in the water that's starting to boil. At what point will not just all of us, but each of us as individuals, so that it does become all of us, realize that we have to be part of the solution and that apathy or complacency or arrogance is going to be our own undoing. And, you know, in re writing my, my book, Lead With We, I did some research around the mindsets of Indigenous peoples. And what was so powerful was that in some of those cultures, anyone who took more than they actually needed for their own well-being, their own subsistence, it was considered a, 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 a version of mental illness hmm. because the health and well-being of the whole was the primus, was primary. And so if you threaten the whole in service of yourself, it was seen as mad because it's effectively you're, you're killing yourself as well as everybody else. And here we see that played out so broadly around the world in terms of, you know, self-interest coming at the cost of everybody's futures. So, you know, I don't think we're learning something new, honestly. I think we're just remembering what we forgot, Joseph. I think this is hardwired in us. I think we, are, we come into this world, as I said, you know, connected to each other and to the planet and Indigenous cultures from North and South America and from the Poles and Aboriginal culture in Australia and all around the world have been screaming at us for the last couple of decades to realise that there's another way of living with each other and with the environment which better serves everyone. And I hope that we're going to get there in time. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was going to say we come in, we come in naked, and we leave as kangaroos. But that's uh, another right. story. And all that is who doesn't who hasn't heard that today? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, we started with May West, and we ended up with naked kangaroos. Um, right. The 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 actual people that you were referring to uh, in terms of indigenous cultures and people, um, which which uh, which culture was that in particular? Well, you know, I've done a lot of reading in and around um, a wonderful author called Lynn Twist, which who wrote a book about the soul of money. And she um, she works a lot with the Pachamama Alliance. She's the co-founder of the Pachamama Alliance, which is, you know, Ecuador and Peru, and you've got the Amazon. And she does a lot of work to protect the sacred headwaters of the Amazon. So, you know, through Le reading Lynn's books, uh, through having some conversations with Lynn, and also, you know, um, reading about Indigenous cultures more broadly and what they have in common as opposed to what's different between them, you see that they have this symbiotic relationship with the natural world. And instead of stealing from nature, they serve nature. And they had this almost, they grew up generationally over hundreds and thousands of years, um, literally living within nature, being a subset of the larger natural world. And they had a very, what we might call a robust dialogue with the natural world in terms of plants and medicine and weather and what the ants are telling them and so on and so on and so on. And as a result, they reflected the sort of operating laws of the natural world, which is there's codependencies, there's symbiosis, there's um, mutualities between them, which they've got to respect. And when you breach those, you're working against the natural laws, the natural order of things. And that's what they would characterize as madness, which I think is a wholly appropriate way to apply the term. It's it's uh, yeah, I'm I'm going to I'm going to uh, think about this interview for not just a long time, uh, not even interview. It's more like a conversation. Um, but but uh, maybe maybe for the rest of my life. Um, this is this is the quote that I found for you today, um, which which I think just, you know, sets up again this idea, the the polarized world. Right. It comes back to exactly what you said at the beginning about the two realities. We're all in it together. Sound familiar? Sounds like what we were saying right at the beginning of COVID versus me and mine, 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 like those Daffy Duck to, to Bugs yeah. Bunny and to hell with everyone else. I think this sets up, these are the new parties. These are the new uh, political parties. These should be the pol political parties. And in fact, it should be a landslide uh, victory uh, for we versus me. Uh, but maybe that's just uh, wishful thinking. Well, I think here's why I'm optimistic, because it is easy to look at the headlines every day and throw up your hands and say, oh, my God, you know, we're and actually Lancet Planetary Health Report at the end of the la end of last year came out and it said that 56% um, of 18 to 25 year olds around the world think humanity is doomed. Wow. And that was reported by Vice at the time. And I've got an 18, a 19 and a 22 year old daughter. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, compare that to the mindset of old white guys like me when I was growing up. We thought the world 
was just going to go on forever. There was infinite resources and there was always a better day over the horizon. Imagine growing up in the opposite, you know. So, you know, with, with that, I'm optimistic for several reasons. Those older mindsets are now giving way to a new narrative and practice of business. You see it at Davos, you see it at COP26, you see it after the IPCC report. One of the headlines in the most recent IPCC report said, delay means death, to the point about, you know, normalization or desensitization to these languages, you know, to this language. We have to show up differently now. The other reason I am very optimistic is this new class of entrepreneurs coming through, millennials and Gen Z, who are going into business to solve problems. Another reason I'm optimistic is our survival instinct, to your point. I do think we don't want to go out of business. I think we will leave it to the last minute, but we will course correct because we do want to survive. And I do think, despite the tragedy around the globe that COVID is, it has given so many of us cause to pause, to really soberly look at what's important in our lives, to take stock of what we've done to, e to each other and the planet, and to then beyond that think, well, I want to do things differently moving forward. And I think, the, you know, we've got to turn 90 degrees, Joseph, and that first 15 degrees is the hardest, like the G-forces when you're trying to turn a car and it just doesn't want to turn. But the more hands you get on the wheel and the stronger you hold on it, you'll get past that first 15 percent and then it gets easier and it builds momentum and the market forces will join us and more and more entrepreneurs will pile in. And then we will look back in 10 or 15 years and go, we were absolutely moronic in the way that we you know, went about business. We were putting ourselves out of business and now we see a much more abundant and regenerative future that's possible. And I think it'll be the beginning of an incredible renaissance for business. Uh, I, I certainly hope so. You know, it's um, in, in Built to Suck, I wrote about the survival instinct. And, uh, and I actually said, we need to be survivalists. And there, of course, there are two ways to think about being a survivalist. One is, one is, is I don't want to die, right? And the other one is, is I can actually figure out how to live with minimal with not with not many resource i can be resource resourceful in term in terms of being able to figure out how to survive and thrive in and under harsh conditions but but when you actually look at the survival instinct the survival instinct has two forms which is self preservation and adaptation and the way that i interpreted that is self preservation is is don't kill me Adaptation is I'm going to kill you, but it's like this idea: one is reactive, the other one is proactive, right. and uh, one is incremental, right? D motivated by fear and by pain. The mm. other one is about uh, about hunger and and about risk and tolerance for risk. And and so, like, I love how you mention the survival instinct, um, but you have to fear, you have to feel or fear that your life is in danger and or you have to really, really believe in a better way. And so, like, I, I want to I want to ask you maybe as one final question, which is yeah. uh, which how do we sell this through? Right. Because yeah. because, you know, you know, the quote uh, change happens when the pain of not changing is greater than the pain sure. of changing. So so one of the things you've written about, uh, I really, really uh, want to just encourage everyone like I've never on the show in three hundred and fifty uh, five other uh, interviews, not that they weren't great, they were, but uh, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe uh, to Lead With We, uh, and and go and find out more. And, and at, at the flipping minimum, come on, everyone. You know, it's like, <laughs> it, it, it's you're, you're stealing from this man. No, uh, <laughs> go and buy the book. Um, but but I, I would love for you to to just finish off and talk to this idea of, of in order to answer the question, how do we work together in new ways to accelerate and scale our response to the challenges we face, how do we sell this through? How do we sell it through to a skeptical board, to a power hungry, you know, executive, uh, to someone who wants to hold on to their, you know, golden parachute uh, for as long as possible and perpetuate the status quo? A great question. And I want to answer in a few parts. Firstly, the reason this is so challenging is the urgency is the, is the timeline of the urgency, the horizon line. You know, unfortunately, the climate emergency is contracting towards us, but compared to your house being on fire today, it doesn't have the same urgency. It takes too long. 
but sadly that urgency is increasing. But it's one of the reasons we kick the can down the road. It's slow and gradual. All of these pain points have been increasing over time and they weren't immediate and urgent in our daily experience of life. They are increasingly so. Secondly, to boiling like frogs in the water boiling, here's the question that keeps me up at night. You know, the one question way of asking the question is, will we change in time? But the question that worries me is, will we change in time for who? Like who's going to be lost? Who's going to suffer? Who will, lives will be lost be, just to preserve the lives of others? You know, the, the disenfranchised, those who live on six or $10 a day around the world, you know, who are going to be uh, disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis. That's what worries me. To your question about how you convince others to come with you, I think you need to shift the context in which you ask the question, but then take it back. And what do I mean? I could speak to a board and say, listen, you're the CEO, the CFO, the CMO, the CSO, and all that glorious stuff that you have in boardrooms. Or I could say, you know what, I'd like to speak to you as a father, as an uncle, as a cousin, as a son, and have a conversation in that context. So can everyone in the room, can you all hold up your phones for a second and show me what's on the cover of your phone? Show me your phone if you have a picture of your family or someone in the family on the phone. That's the person I want to talk to. That's one way, is a bit of a reframe. Then secondly, you've got to do a cost-benefit analysis where you appeal to the business case for doing so, to your point about these companies that are incentivized to do more of the same. You've got to say, okay, what's the research behind this in terms of reputation enhancement, building a resilient culture, um, consumer preferences, relevance to the future, mitigating risk, all of those different metrics that are out there from everyone. The case is overwhelming, so the research. Secondly, you've got to do a competitive analysis or audit where you show companies that are direct competitors or are competitors in adjacent industries and show them what they're doing to start to tap into their competitive instinct and go, wait a second, if they're doing that, they're either crazy or maybe there's something in it. And then thirdly, you've got to do a double-handed cost-benefit analysis. So what is the cost of changing to do less bad and more good? But also, what is the benefit of doing that? Reputation enhancement, resilient culture, talent attraction, retention, productivity, satisfaction, whatever. But then also, for the second part of it, do a cost-benefit analysis of not doing it. What is it going to cost you to not do it? Lack of relevance to the future wrong side of history, won't tap into emerging market forces. And what's the benefit in terms of what it's going to save you? It might save you some time. It will save you X amount of dollars. It may save you the hassle of having to show up meaningfully. And then when you do the research, the competitive audit, and a cost-benefit analysis for doing it and not doing it, and then you leave them for three days, in my experience, it starts to get the wheel spinning, especially to contextualize it in terms of who they are as human beings, and it's no accident that I talked about father, brother, rather than mother, daughter, to get them to start thinking in new ways. And we typically find that you can start to bring them around and they'll have that next tier of conversation. And quickly, it's exponential, then it rapidly increases and they're on board to, to do some really substantive changes. So hopefully that helps. It, it certainly does. And, you know, uh, uh, the ROI question, I mean, I've also so many different spins on it. I've, I've sometimes spoken about it as ROI, you mm -hmm. know, like ask why, but, but the other one is uh, I've often said, what's the aura? I mean, similar, what's the ROI of survival? I mean, it's like, are we, are we in fact measuring the right things, you know, and, and, uh, and is our, and we know the answer our eyes are never on the prize because it is uh, instant gratification on a corporate and a and a and a greed level, uh, but something that I've been actually now noodling with, taking a lesson from Web three, is what I'm calling sorry Unweb 1.0, as we're now right. calling it, is right. is brand FOMO, and right. uh, and and the the thing that that made me um, that that triggered this idea, the me thinking about this now, is the fact that most brands most corporations are not going to do things because no one's doing them they're going to do it because everyone is doing them or because they fear that that their competitors will do it before they do and and you know what if that's what it takes to sell this thing through then this is what we got to do um because we have to start somewhere and um and 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 that and the flip of course of this idea of i love the idea of 
instead of the cost benefit of doing it, how about the cost benefit of not doing it? And we certainly see a lot of precedent uh, out there. Um, so Simon, uh, you did not disappoint. If good things come to those who wait, I'm glad that I waited for you. Uh, you know, and with my apologies uh, uh, about the naked kangaroo, but you know what? If I could go back and change it all again, I wouldn't. Uh, you know what? I agree. I agree. I feel somehow liberated by that photo. Thank you. So you know what? The only way sometimes we can uh, survive uh, and cope with all the heaviness of the world is to be a little silly. Uh, but but you would be silly if you do not go out and buy lead uh, with we. Uh, find out more uh, about uh, Simon Mainwaring, the founder and CEO of of We First. Sure, you can find out about the cakes he makes, uh, but more importantly, uh, be serious and take this seriously and figure out what your role is, what your responsibility is, and what contribution you can make to make sure that that the world that you leave behind you is in a better position after your contribution, uh, not in spite of it. And uh, so buy Lead With We, which launched November 21st. Go to leadwithwe.com, subscribe to the podcast, and find out all about how to work with Simon and his company at wefirstbranding.com. And of course, if you want to follow uh, him personally on the Twitter, Simon Mainwaring, and uh, likewise on Instagram. Uh, Simon, you are a scholar, a gentleman. Uh, keep your hair the way it is. Don't ever change. Um, and I will tell you that uh, Chuck Norris uh, absolutely loved this episode. You are Chuck Norris approved. And we that will be back. I, I mean, you know what? I mean, I mean, he's he's either, if he gives you a thumbs up, you're good. If he gives you a thumbs down, it means Chuck Norris is coming after you. So we will be back soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching the show about hope, positivity, optimism, and if there's time left over, a little bit of marketing with your host, multiple author and global keynote speaker, Joseph Jaffe. If you like the show, tell a friend or two. Please subscribe to the show. And if you want to get inside news, previews of upcoming guests and much more, visit josephjaffe.com slash subscribe to sign up for the show's newsletter. And despite the best ministrations of your wife, you still look ugly. <laughs> <laughs>